So uh, it's really a pleasure to have Oliver Port here with us today, at least virtually. And thank you, Oliver, for accepting the invitation. <clears throat> so a few words about the speaker. Oliver received his diploma in physics from the University of Heidelberg and his PhD from the same university on 2011, 10 years ago, uh, working on the formation of relativistic jets under the supervision of uh, Christian Fenn. Uh, after that, he has worked uh, as a postdoctoral research fellow in Leuven, Belgium, in Leeds, uh, UK, and in Frankfurt, Germany, uh, before moving to the Netherlands in 2018. And he's now an assistant professor in the Anton Panekek Institute in the University of Amsterdam. Uh, his work is focused on the study of uh, the dynamics of magnetized uh, relativistic astrophysical plasmas, uh, mostly through numerical simulations. Uh, he's an expert in computational fluid dynamics, key contributor to various uh, existing codes, uh, currently the leader of the development of a new general relativistic uh, MHD code called uh, Black Hole Accretion Code, uh, and author of many important works, works uh, on uh, related topics. Uh, ranging from modeling pulsar wind nebulae. And I should say that I was amazed uh, when I saw, uh, first saw his 3D simulations on pulsar, on crab pulsar wind nebula, uh, how well they reproduce the observations and apparently solve a long standing problem, the sigma problem, uh, which uh, has to do with, for the non experts, uh, has to do with uh, the transformation of pointing dominated flows uh, near the pulsar to a matter dominated wind, wind when the wind terminates. Um, also modeling of jets from rotating magnetospheres related to active galactic nuclei and gamma ray bursts, studying their formation, their stability, their synchrotron emission. He's also involved in the interpretation of the event horizon telescope observations, uh, many important uh, contributions to these topics. Uh, today, he's going to talk about the friends of black holes, as he calls the accretion and jet formation around compact objects. So please, Oliver, you can start your talk. All right. <laughs> Was that really me? <laughs> Thank you very much for the very kind introduction, uh, Nectarius. Uh, yes, indeed, I want to talk about the uh, well, black holes mostly, and uh, also talk a bit about their friends, but also we'll talk about work done with collaborators and friends here. So uh, it's kind of uh, two meanings to that uh, <clears throat> word. Um, right, uh, let me give you a bit of an outline uh, what I want to talk about. I want to give a bit of a back of the envelope, uh, like estimates about like the processes we're interested in, like the interest in accretion and jet formation. Uh, so just back of the envelope, what, what can we already build some intuition um, about that? And then, yeah, um, I'm a numerical modeler, so let's go into numerical modeling. Then um, I picked uh, like three highlight topics uh, of that, of what we are doing currently. They are all revolving around uh, the galactic center. So we're interested in the dynamics of the galactic center um, where we are really have like stunning resolution, uh, not yet with the EHT, but with the gravity instrument, which I will also briefly introduce. So um, it's going to be about uh, dynamical features we see there, and then I'll yeah move on to uh, strange compact objects, so that are probably not that crackpot uh, as you might think, uh, but yeah, they are really interesting too. They give rise to very interesting dynamics, at least. Okay, so the power of accretion. Now let's uh, just really start with the very basics. So from the four fundamental forces, gravity is the only one that you can't shield and that has a formally infinite range. So it really is the force that matters in all of astrophysics. And whenever you drop something into a massive object, uh, you're growing its mass, you're growing its binding energy. And that means uh, you're accreting something. So that's uh, uh, one way to define a black hole accretion. And yeah, it's no secret that uh, uh, the, the potential energy that you can tap by dropping something uh, from infinity to a radius r onto an object with mass m is like basically just the uh, difference in potential energy. But uh, this, of course, gives rise to like a luminosity, and then now it just depends how quickly can you drop matter into this potential well. And that gives rise to like all the energy that you have to liberate. Uh, um, in principle. So 
yeah, how can we maximize that? How can we gain some intuition about like, what is that energy? Um, what is the maximum that you can tap? And yeah, if you want to maximize the accretion luminosity, you just have to look at what, yeah, what, what do we have here? So for example, you could make the radius really small for a given mass. And that means making the object you're talking about more and more compact. So <clears throat> if you accrete onto a compact object of which a black hole is, well, the most compact object, you can tap uh, more and more uh, energy. So formally in case of a black hole, if we just say our oh, innermost radius is the gravitational radius gm over c square. So the fundamental radius of Einstein's theory of gravity in terms of black holes at least. Uh, you actually find out somewhat coincidentally that the accretion luminosity, so the power uh, that you get is just m dot c square. So basically you're tapping all the rest mass power um, uh, if you drop something into a black hole. And this is of course uh, quite a lot of power. So just to give it some uh, numbers. So if we are talking about a supermassive black hole, I could like pick up several uh, examples of like really energetic phenomena, but just say, let's stay with the supermassive black hole picture. So for a quasar, let's say we are having a 10 to the nine solar mass black hole and we swallow uh, one solar mass per year. So that's what we drop. That's pretty much the maximum you can do for this black hole mass. So that's kind of close to the Eddington limit. We are having a luminosity of 10 to the 13 solar luminosities. So that's really a, a, a beefy amount of energy. And that's of course rivaling all the power of all the stars in the galaxy. And the phenomenon that this gives rise to is known as quasars where yeah, Martin Schmidt in 63 really looked at this uh, first quasar, uh, 3C273, 3 C, 3 C uh, which was known as a radio source and was able to like get the spectrum and get the redshift and now suddenly everything unfolds and you get like the real distance and knowing how luminous this thing actually is. Um, and that thing is, um, <clears throat> has a luminosity of four times 10 to the 12 solar uh, luminosity is coming from a region of a size of uh, around a light year across or less than a light year across. So you're, yeah, really a very similar numbers to uh, what I've quoted up here for this, for this quasar. Um, and yeah, that just shows you that the you know, accretion is like a key player in like uh, feedbacking energy um, back uh, into the galaxy. So it's, yeah. That's uh, quite a hefty amount. So, but also something that you see here, and uh, no, that's also why I picked this. So you see actually not only the bright nu galactic nucleus, but you see a second thing here, which is known as a, as a jet. So this is the famous jet of CC273. Um, it's a straight ray or not so straight ray coming out of the galactic center. Uh, the most famous jet, uh, which was also described as a straight ray uh, is the M87 jet. So our uh, neighbor galaxy in Virgo A, it was described more than 100 years ago uh, by Curtis uh, as a curious straight ray, which lies in a gap within a velocity apparently connected by the uh, with the nucleus by a thin line of matter. So if you squint your eyes and your resolution is good on your screen, you can see this kind of curious straight ray right here. And uh, we use this uh, centenary as an occasion to write a review book about yeah some jets and we contributed some some chapter on numerical simulations of jets with Sergei Komisarov so just as advertisement uh, yeah but M87 jet is really the best studied so let's uh, really just uh, enjoy all its glory and like let's do what radio astrophysicists do and uh, increase uh, slowly increase the frequency and uh, the baseline so we can really see the whole extent of of that flow. So here you see like a low far a few hundred megahertz uh, image showing that well, this, this jet is kind of connected to plasma outflows that are you know, larger than the entire galaxy. Now we can really play the game and increase the frequency and zo start zooming in on this, on this really curious jet. So here's a composite image now with uh, VLA on top. So you see the scale, so we're zooming in here now. Um, yeah, so that gives you like uh, the, this VLA uh, jet uh, really showing how it's how its outflow is connected to the galactic, uh, to the, yeah, to the nucleus here. 
And yeah, you can zoom in further showing this. This is a pretty one-sided jet uh, giving you uh, a hint that there is relativistic motion involved. And so this is 43 gigahertz. You see lots of structure, this limb brightening apparently. Um, it can go to 86 gigahertz uh, on scales of a few hundred Schwarzschild radii. And um, yeah, that thing keeps on connecting to the galactic center. Uh, and of course, ultimately, you have the uh, EHT image, uh, well, on the scale of a few gravitational radii. Um, uh, that's where essentially the jet is then rooted. So how can we understand this jet phenomenon um, in somewhat simple terms um, before we like really venture into the numerical simulations? So um, a very simple model, but that's really quite instructive on the whole physics of it is this, uh, this idea of um, uh, a conducting sphere uh, that's threaded by some kind of large scale ambient magnetic field. And as you probably are aware, once you start uh, rotating that sphere, you're kind of inducing an electric field along the surface of that sphere, right? Uh, just uh, B cross V essentially. And that electric field leads to a polarization of the sphere. So you have the po positive charges sitting right here in the equator and the negative charges sitting up here. And yeah, that's uh, well known from electrodynamics. Um, but a jet uh, seems to like transport energy. So how can we tap energy out of such a scenario? So we have to consider the radial pointing flux here and that's E cross B and the component that's relevant here is then uh, if you're looking at the radial component, it's E theta B phi. So what this tells you next to this E theta component that we just made by rotating the sphere, you also need a toroidal component, which is uh, B phi. And to get a toroidal component, that actually means you have to have some kind of toroidal current that closes uh, in the plane of your screens. Um, right, and that actually needs to close in the magnetosphere. So let's just illustrate that a little bit. So when we have some kind of conducting plasma here, we can have a current loop uh, that connects uh, all of that uh, engine. So uh, now you can do quite a lot with that current. You can dissipate it like ohmic heating, like giving rise to emission, or you could uh, use its Lorentz force to accelerate the bulk flow. And that's exactly what then happens in, in a jet. So if we flip that on the side, uh, just to make a bit progress with that a simple model, uh, we can see how we then have a toroidal field. So overall, this gives rise to like a helical field. Uh, now we're looking like uh, down the rotation axis here. And it just so turns out that your electric field, uh, uh, E theta, is very similar to B phi uh, when you're, at least when you're far away from the source, which is a handy expression. So plugging this back into our pointing flux means we're dealing with E theta square, which you already know. So that's velocity square times BR square, just our V cross B argument. Okay, so what did we get? Uh, we know the pointing flux, we can like multiply with some surfaces to get an energy flux out of this. So uh, that's done here. Uh, and if this conducting sphere is a pulsar, uh, we now know what is the power that uh, you can extract out of rotational energy uh, from this kind of conducting Newton star in that, in that picture. And that goes like the uh, spin frequency square times the flux uh, that you use to thread the central object. And if we do the appropriate alterations for a black hole, so instead of spinning uh, the object or the event horizon, if you wanted, you can uh, actually induce an electric field from the frame dragging effect. And it turns out uh, that uh, rewriting then the space time rotation in terms of a spin parameter gives you like this very much related equation, which is uh, first done by Blanford and Znajek. And it's known as the Blanford and Snyak uh, power. So if you have a black hole, that's kind of uh, the power you would uh, extract out of its spin energy. And that means for a given mass, the jet power depends on the squares of the spin and the magnetic flux. And now it's just a matter of, like, if you want to know what is the maximum that you can like, get out, just to have some, some number. 
Uh, it turns out that that really critically uh, depends on how much flux you can feed onto the black hole. And um, I'm going to go into that phenomena later. That's called then a magnetically arrested disk. It's really when you put the maximum of the flux onto the black hole. And uh, there it turns out that you can tap the all of the rest mass energy just like with accretion luminosity um, and even more um, as it turns out. Okay, so these were just some back of the envelopes uh, just to get us into the, uh, into the groove. Um, so but what we're actually doing is of course uh, the numerical modeling and yeah, just like to briefly introduce like the code that uh, yeah, spent some time writing and uh, uh, expanding and having, building a bit of a community around it. So that's the uh, black hole accretion code that Nectarius already mentioned. It's a pretty versatile GMHD code uh, can do all sorts of coordinates. I think we are doing 16 coordinate systems and transformations. It says a block-based AMR scheme, uh, constraint transport, and we just managed to run it on more than 60,000 cores. Uh, we're not only doing black hole accretion with it, so we can do four-three uh, magnetospheres uh, for like a, here's a quadrodipole uh, magnetosphere, so uh, inspired by some some nicer uh, results where you have like the non-standard dipole magnetics magnetospheres uh, starting to look into uh, more interesting magnetospheres now uh, using force-free uh, dynamics. Um, of course, Tony is in, in the audience. Uh, he's using this to, uh, to do gravitational wave counterpart modeling. And we're starting to venture into creating pulsars, um, do resistive MHD and the connection. And of course, the whole thing was built uh, to model supermassive black holes. And yeah, let's just uh, see what actually came out of that uh, real quick. Uh, so this is the EHT uh, image, uh, like nicely decomposed or composed like next to a GRMHD simulation. So this is, I think, the yeah, one of the first times that we actually quantitatively matched like a big library of simulations to real observational data. And that's quite exciting. Of course, we can, we're doing this now on, on horizon scales uh, where we're really probing strong field gravity um, for the first time. So yeah, let's take a step back and let's think about, okay, like what did this all give us? And what did we learn? Uh, uh, from comparing the GRMHD simulations to like, the real observational data. It's like a really complicated fitting and uh, scoring pipeline. So it actually turns out that almost all the tested GRMHD simulations, so we're having this mat, so it's maximal magnetic field threaded uh, black holes. We have some SANE models and we basically also scan through the entire spin. It turns out that basically all of them are consistent with the EHT image. They all make rings. Um, uh, some are smaller because you're looking at like a little ring in the jet instead of uh, what we call here the photon ring. But I think most of the emission comes from lensed disk plasma to be perfectly honest. Um, um, so they all make rings uh, and just a few escape and make smaller and bigger rings, but of course they are all then consistent with the EHT image. It just becomes interesting again if you put additional constraints at the moment. So, for example, we we made a constraint where we add, uh, where we ask that uh, these models have to also next to just fitting the image, they also have to produce a minimum jet power of 10 to the 42 ergs uh, per second, and that's really quite a conservative estimate because yeah, the jet power in M87 uh, ranges from 42 to 45, 10 to the 45 ergs per second. So we should at least produce that. Um, and yeah, um, actually the models do. Uh, they, the data is consistent uh, with the extraction of spin energy by this blind pots and thigh mechanism that I that I have illustrated. Um, and yeah, but we actually need, yeah, quite, we need actually to tap spin energy. So that's good. Um, um, and all of the models uh, that are like low, low spinning or essentially ruled out. So we're starting to place some constraints on uh, uh, what can be the spin of the uh, supermassive black hole in, in 87. 
uh, right now. So um, unfortunately, I can't just do the segue into, just segue into like showing the pictures of the galactic center because we aren't there yet. But I can show you uh, something else about the galactic center that's really quite exciting and uh, interesting to model. So let's turn to the galactic center. In principle, the galactic center is the better laboratory for fundamental physics than uh, compared to M87 because we know its mass and distance really quite well. And that is, of course, thanks to the uh, Nobel Prize worthy results of uh, Andrea Getz and Reinhard Genzel, uh, who really made like precision measurements of orbits of stars around uh, the Sagittarius A star uh, black hole. So knowing the mass is really uh, important because uh, in alternative theories of gravity and like theories like the playback deck lab game, you can predict also shadows. And uh, yeah, if they don't match, uh, if they, they match to the, to the object you're observing, you could say something about gravity itself um, by doing that. So yeah, that's of course then interesting to do uh, with this very well-known mass. But uh, the thing that we are more interested in is like dynamics. And yeah, one exciting thing uh, that came out of uh, um, the Gravity X Observing Run 2018 is uh, the capability to actually uh, have like astrometric resolutions that well, rival EHT resolution. And what they found is uh, in 2018, they found uh, uh, three infrared flares. So the galactic center flares around uh, four times a day in the infrared, once once in the X-rays round about. So we have some chances of actually catch, catching a flare in your observations. And they, they managed to do this three times. And they also managed to uh, really resolve the astrometrics um, on scales of around 10 gravitational radii. So you were similarly probing the same regime as we're doing with EHT. So these are uh, basically the astrometric data points. Um, and yeah, there are some capillarian uh, fits to the data. Like two things are interesting or particularly interesting in this. So I think it already strikes you that capillarian fit is not really doing so well. It seems to be uh, biased towards uh, somewhat smaller radii. That means kind of the data favors. It's not exactly significant, but the data seems to favor somewhat a supercaplarian motion, which is of course noteworthy if you think about like what could be a dynamical origin for that. Um, but another thing that's also very interesting in that observation is that the polarization uh, that you observed during that once around the black hole circle also made one one full circle in, in, in the Stokes vectors. And this is really hard to produce with the standard toroidal magnetic field configurations that we have in magneti magnetically rotating disk uh, uh, typically. So it actually implies a poloidal magnetic field geometry. So what's the point here? So we want to use GRMHD simulations to, uh, to actually yeah, inform flare models and like see if we can come up with what's going on in the galactic center that produces this phenomenology. We're doing already pretty well with GRMHD simulations, so we can match uh, spectra to a good good extent, uh, the source sizes, and the average polarization degree, and even the millimeter variability where you have like a kind of bubbling accretion variability of around fifty percent. This is also naturally uh, produced by produced by of GRMHD turbulent accretion uh, models. So, but how do we, yeah, make progress? And I try to explain these kind of features. Uh, the first uh, model that, yeah, I'd like to present is, yeah, well, this kind of cute idea of having uh, orbiting flux bundles in this magnetically arrested disk regime. Uh, and what do I mean with flux bundles? So I colored a couple of field lines, I made them yellow when they are like normal in, in the disk. So they are like toroidal magnetic fields. And then on top of that, you also have this, uh, which I suggest, suggestively colored red. This is what I call a flux bundle. It's uh, really has this poloidal magnetic uh, field configuration. 
And that's composed of actually a plasma that was formerly rooted on the black hole and has been actually expelled and now to orbit uh, in the accretion disk. I'm going to show a little animation in a few slides. Um, so these are these uh, flux tubes and yeah, it's just interesting to ask like what is the dynamics and can it kind of be compared to what we've seen uh, with gravity. So why look at the mad flux bundles in particular? So there's three reasons. The magnetically rotational instability is really quenched. These features can in principle survive. How long they can survive? Yeah, that is not so easy to answer. So we have to simulate uh, that. Um, they have this predominantly vertical orientation, which is nice for to match polarization. And there's a claim that magnetic ray connection is also associated with like the eruption process of these flux bundles. Give, would give you like a nice uh, package deal to have associated particle acceleration. Uh, is the galactic center mad? So is it in this like really magnetically uh, dominated state? I think uh, the jury is still out there. Of course, we don't see a jet at the moment in the galactic center and only when the galactic center flares spectrally at least it looks like uh, a jet. On the other hand, uh, from large scale simulations, uh, it looks like uh, there's enough flux being advected uh, to the galactic center from stellar winds uh, to actually get into the mad limit. So I think it's, it's quite an interesting possibility to uh, explore. Okay, so here are a few simulations. Um, that we did. I like just to like just to do the focus on this middle panel here, where I um, show the flux in the black hole. So this is this um, magnetic flux that I've talked about before, and the jet power estimate uh, appropriately normalized. And you can see that this uh, like gets uh, onto a maximum. Um, yeah, which is just given essentially by the scalite of the disk. And you can see that not only like goes to the maximum, but also in particular for this counter rotating case, you see like uh, that the flux oscillates and you have this episodes where the flux is actually expelled from the black hole. Uh, and like almost by a factor of two, the, the flux is depleted and then slowly re um, uh, yeah, over a few, um, uh, hours, well, not quite an hour, yeah. So, um, right, so there's uh, just some interesting dynamics here and at the same time in that MAT regime for that model, for example, you're extracting uh, more than 100% of the uh, accretion rate as a jet. Um, right, uh, yeah, just I, show, I wanted to show some like, animation of that. Um, uh, of the orbits of those uh, flux bundles and this is here. So here I'm being in the equatorial plane and we select these flux bundles as like region of suppressed magnetically rotational instability, suppressed MRI. Um, and we're just following their paths. So these are essentially these moving flux bundles and you can see that they're being like created um, kind of start close to the black hole, they're being expelled from the black hole, they kind of spiral out. So there's spiral streams of dense plasma being like accreting onto the black hole and in between those spiral streams, actually these uh, flux bundles that have the way to leak out of the black hole and then they go out and yeah, circularize. Um, yeah, making beautiful circular orbits eventually. So, can I get rid of this? Cool. So there's uh, lots of process in, involved and it's not entirely understood exactly how the flux then leaks out. There's a, well, definitely three dimensional effects, uh, some kind of interchange instability where you change thick, like heavy disk plasma with this uh, light um, magnetically dominated plasma on the black hole. It's also a nice idea that you can reconnect flux out of the black hole um, I'm not going to into the details here of that. So here I just show some traces of yeah 
like how does it look like if you um, like follow those orbits of those uh, features we have seen. So you can see that uh, you recover quite a range of, of orbits. Uh, um, so essentially, the as we've seen, this, the features spiral out. And then actually, as they do that, they want to uh, remain in pre pressure balance with the ambient medium. So they actually do expand. And that means they have to slowly lose their magnetic dominance, making them susceptible to instabilities, uh, and then they will then dissolve due to kelvin helmholtz instabilities, uh, and then the flux will be eventually re-accreted. The whole process can, can repeat, so that's kind of the overall uh, cycle. Uh, yeah, first thing that you should ask, so is this a viable model for flare? So do we even have the energetics in these uh, flux bundles? Uh, what we do is we try to, you know, we basically ray trace uh, the simulations and fit the, the millimeter flux, which is during a flare not, not really highly variable. So you have an average of 2.4 Janskis and that sets the in entire uh, normalization. So uh, we just measure the uh, energy of the flux bundle uh, within one scale of the disk and get this distribution. So overall you have 10 to the 38 uh, ergs uh, in the co-rotating cases, and it's actually quite nice to see that these counter-rotating cases, which, which had these like, like bigger dips in the magnetic flux, are all more or less in order of magnitude, uh, more energetic, these, uh, these explosions. So, uh, yeah, we also look at the size distribution, so this is also important, like uh, you need to have enough energy in the, at small enough sizes, so we find even 10 to the 39 ergs at like for really compact flux tubes that have a size of two uh, gravitational radii. So that's really needed to have like explain the substructure and, and the light curves. So yeah, that seems to be actually quite positive. We have enough power to do to power flares, uh, like a strong X-ray flares, uh, a few times 10 to the 37 and infrared flares are quite a bit weaker. So yeah, there's quite some, some room uh, for that. But one, one thing that's really striking and yeah, you can't really recover from uh, so easily is if we just look at the period's radius relation of these tracked features. Uh, so if we say this, these features have something to do with the flares uh, by stirring up the plasma uh, and heating locally the plasma that gives rise to a flare. Um, uh, these these features are like have like these kind of periods. Uh, so here I'm showing the period versus radius relationship. Uh, um, where here are the gravity data points. So these three gravity flares uh, fitted with Keplerian orbit. Here's a, a super Keplerian fit that kind of fits the data a bit better actually. Um, so these are all down here, and the features that we have are significantly subcaplarian. Uh, so they actually are obstacles in the flow, and they really torque, uh, have like large scale stresses that, uh, that torque the accretion disk and actually extract uh, uh, angular momentum with these large scale stresses. And uh, so the accretion flow is actually then kind of braked by this feature. So um, it actually makes quite hard now to um, think about this as being the uh, responsible for the gravity flare. So there's a bit of a tension uh, at the moment. So if the data is accurate, uh, these uh, orbiting flux bundles uh, seem yeah, like a very good idea, but uh, perhaps uh, not the last word in the story. So um, what else can we uh, think about? in terms of dynamical features that we see that could give rise to like flare-like flare type phenomena. And GMHD is really quite rich these days. Uh, we having like lots of structure uh, to, uh, that we can resolve. Uh, so I'm showing also uh, some results from Antonis Nathaniel who, who led that investigation. Uh, so when you do like high resolution MHD simulation, you see lots of these little critters here. So lots of these islands, uh, 
like popping up everywhere in the accretion flow. And these are, uh, these are plasmoids. So what is a plasmoid and why is it useful? Um, a plasmoid uh, forms during the reconnection process and uh, they're really experts in the audience. So I hope I will not make a fool of myself. Uh, but in a reconnecting current sheet, you have an instability called the tearing instability. And that's depicted here as a pick simulation that I did. <laughs> so my first pick simulation uh, was this. Uh, and they use, it shows you like there's a whole hierarchy of smaller and bigger uh, plasmoids that actually emerge. And while they do that, they like, take their, their relativistic particles along and can form the harder, larger structures. Um, and the dynamics of that is really quite intricate. So which was also pointed out by Maria and by Aika Kogian recently that actually there's ongoing particle acceleration in that uh, those plasmoids uh, that yeah, kind of compress and adiabatically uh, accelerate particles, uh, kind of like an ideal mechanism. Uh, doesn't need uh, really kinetic effects to do that. So yeah, we're finding out more and more things about uh, plasmoid reconnection. And yeah, these, these plasmoid chains are kind of replacing like the standard blob uh, blazar uh, modeling uh, framework because they, they kind of make a, a physically motivated framework for uh, uh, multi-time scale laser variability, for example, like here in a nice paper by uh, Christie. Um, right, so also in the galactic center, this has been like proposed as having these plasmoids around and yeah, like looking at the orbits would kind of uh, knowing that they trap all these particles uh, is making kind of a natural, uh, natural model to look at. So what actually happens in GRMHD simulations? And yeah, the, the real nice story is that, or the nice news is that yeah, we are starting to really resolve these features. Um, this is a plot where we show the toroidal magnetic field, the temperature essentially, uh, and the Bernoulli parameter. So here's a particularly nice one where you have a entire plasmoid chain, merging plasmoids in the black hole magnetosphere. So here you can see the whole magnetic field reverses on itself. And in between that, you have this uh, uh, plasmoid chain. And um, yeah, one observation that Antonio has made is if the magnetization of the like these upstream field lines is is high, more than around 0.3 or so, then actually uh, the heating of that uh, reconnecting field is enough that these plasmoids will actually be unbound. So they, they have these hot, hot regions and they will actually fly out from the black hole. And yeah, so when you have this reconnecting, reconnecting going on in like the magnetosphere of the black hole, it's, uh, it's a nice uh, site uh, to think about gravity flares because there will not be so distorted by the turbulent accretion flow, but they might actually fly towards you um, in a more regular fashion. So yeah, we can track those plasmoids and uh, start to inform like a simple like, geometric models. And this was done here, for example, not going through that plot, but I just like to point out that, yeah, the dynamics is not entirely trivial. So they're not just adiabatically uh, expanding. So if you look at the entire plasmoid, the reconnection is, reconnection is ongoing uh, and actually it's heating uh, as it actually is uh, receding from the source. So this is some, some dynamics still going on that you should need to like take into account when you model um, and when you use like plasmoid inspired models. Right, so yeah, next steps would be really to, to inform this kind of geometric models that are quite successful like in like matching the electric center uh, flares. Here's a nice paper from Ball. Uh, but yeah, at the end of the day, uh, this is mostly just a geometric model um, uh, of an expanding plasmoid. Of course, it would be really nice to really look at the distribution seen in GRMHD and see if how likely such a such a model would be. Okay, so I was just uh, wanted to like briefly mention this kind of idea of having also plasmoids um, uh, responsible for, for the flares. And we are starting to really resolve that also in 3D. 
then it really becomes interesting to, to look at the, the orbits. Um, and I'm going to switch gears a little bit and while well, we're staying like in the galactic center, but we're going away from, uh, from black holes. Um, and I wanted to spend a bit of time on talking about uh, the so-called boson stars, uh, which is a project led by Hector Olivares, uh, who's now a postdoc in Nijmegen. Um, so what are boson stars? Um, well, we have uh, lots of, uh, have a few scalar fields in astronomy uh, that are like uh, somewhat accepted. So for example, in cosmology, we have this so-called inflaton field that's responsible for for inflation, uh, then we have like dark matter candidates and dark energy candidates. Uh, so on the large scale side, uh, we're working on, as cosmologists are working with this so-called scalar fields. So uh, spin zero uh, bosonic particles essentially. Um, but you can actually uh, take these scalar fields and like collapse them. And when you do that, you can uh, form something that's called a boson star. So it's a collapsed scalar field. Uh, scalar field. Um, right, another example for a scalar field is the Higgs field. So there could be more scalar fields uh, in nature and we don't know yet. So what happens if you have a collapsed scalar field? They can be very compact. The ones we're showing here are this compactness that I introduced like in the very beginning, M of R is 0.1 and for a Schwarzschild black hole uh, you have around about 0.5 so still pretty compact and yeah so in essence these are macroscopic macroscopic uh, Bose-Einstein condensates essentially and we're just considering here the simplest case where the non-rotating boson star and a so-called minimally coupled self-gravitating scalar field uh, that basically just has this potential uh, that's just a function of that scalar and we just have a modified Lagrangian uh, which is just Einstein-Hilbert action modified by that potential and that uh, gives you a boson star that basically uh, acts like dark matter so it gives you a potential well and uh, the energy of that uh, boson star uh, uh, scalar field then contains uh, 10 to the six uh, solar masses, for example. Uh, right, so uh, Hector has built uh, two models, um, model, model A and model B. So they differ somewhat in compactness. They're all pretty good black hole mimickers. So at around 10 gravitational radii, so I'm comparing here the gamma RR metric coefficients to Schwarzschild. So this is Schwarzschild, this is model A, and this is model B. So at within 10 gravitational radii, you couldn't really tell the difference, at least not on this plot. Uh, yeah, here we have the Laps function. It's important to point out that these boson stars don't have a surface. So uh, if you had a surface, I think there was a nice paper by Narayan and uh, Roderick uh, that's uh, ruled out uh, in the galactic center already. So you would get some accretion luminosity from like even this very low luminosity source hitting the surface. But these boson stars actually don't have a surface. So it's basically just a, a dark matter potential. And they don't have an ergo region, they don't have unstable photon orbit, so they actually even don't have a shadow. So they should really look quite different to black holes. And yeah, this is really the case. So it's a it's a fun project to do. And really if you want to understand are we really looking at black holes, you should consider at least some alternatives. Uh, so, so that you get some confidence in what you're looking at. And yeah, we're doing just some GRMHD simulation um, to yeah, yeah, understand how does the accretion onto such an object look like. And here's a movie that I wanted to show. So we start with a standard like black hole torus uh, that then seeds the um, MRI. So it's just a toroidal plasma configuration that uh, becomes turbulent and then creation starts. So this is our compact model. This is model A. And something that, yeah, we were a bit surprised about is like principally you would think you can accrete all the way down uh, to the very center. Uh, 
they have stable circular orbits like everywhere. But it didn't really turn out to be the case. So you had this uh, somewhat of a mini torus, how we call it, uh, that that really remains stable there. It's oscillating a little bit, uh, but yeah, it doesn't really uh, allow plasma to accrete further. So that's a bit curious. Here are some uh, density. Oh, now what happens? Yeah, here are some pictures of the density in the original plane, is a standard car black hole, right? You have this evacuated funnel here on top of the black hole and yeah, accreting torus around it. This boson star model A made this little mini torus, the accretion kind of stalled. And then the less compact boson star, yeah, then we were able to accrete all the way to the center. Um, and yeah, makes making it look quite different at the very end. So some boson star make this little somewhat curious mini tora, and we wanted to understand that a little bit better just to yeah, like understand the dynamics and yeah, and see what they do. And yeah, none of these do evacuated funnels like like this one. And if you look at the magnetization, which is really important to uh, to really launch a jet out of them, none of these have like the evac evacuated funnels. None of these have uh, jet-like uh, outflows. That's of course important if you think about M87, so um, they wouldn't really work. Um, right, so what's the origin of this mini torus? Um, yeah, so we were looking at this uh, and it actually turns out that, yeah, it's quite nice uh, in terms of accretion uh, physics. So if you yeah, recall that the accretion is like promoted via turbulent viscosity driven by the magnetic rotation instability, there's really very few ways you can kill the MRI. You can have two strong fields, like in the case of the MAT, so those flux bundles kind of survived, uh, but you can also have a rotation profile that increases outwards, which is essentially never the case in astrophysics. Uh, it just turns out that this is violated. So and if, if you don't have any magnetic rotation instability anymore, you don't have any transport of angular momentum leading to a stallation at the, of the accretion at the maximum of omega. Uh, so uh, okay, we understand that somewhat. Um, um, so the basic intuition of this rotation loss is if you have a like a black hole or some kind of uh, massive objects. And of course your Keplerian omega uh, velocity goes like just out of minus three half. Um, if you have like some mass that increases with radius, for example, as it's needed in the like, in understanding like rotation curves from galaxies, uh, yeah, the omega profile can be different. And if it's like steeper than R to the third, actually you can have a maximum in omega. And this intuition actually turns out to be exactly right. So in the boson star type A models, uh, you just have a steeply increasing matter energy densities, uh, giving us a maximum omega. So that's shown here. Um, so this is the geodetic omega in the equatorial plane. Oh, it's spherical, so it's everywhere uh, against Keplerian law. Um, this is the kind of one that made the mini torus and you see it has a maximum here and then the boson star type B model. And then we have the simulation, which kind of is quite close. To, uh, it's not just geodetic motion, obviously, but it's, it's quite a close indicator for the maximum of, of the rotation curve also in the simulation. Uh, why do we really care about that so much about where this uh, uh, hole in the, well, where that inner edge of that torus is? And uh, that becomes apparent if you actually do some ray tracing uh, now this is uh, targeted towards the galactic center. I'm showing some synthetic EHG observations um, for an inclination that's compatible with that gravity uh, orientation. So we're looking almost face on, right? If we see those features uh, making almost circles. So for an inclination of 15 degrees. Um, here's a cow black hole, a uh, nice black hole shadow, creation flow around it. But here's our boson star model A, which made this kind of mini torus. And that is of course looking very much like a black hole shadow if you just 
we're able to blow it up a bit by increasing the mass, for example. So this is, for example, why we need to know the mass uh, quite precisely uh, in order to say something about like fundamental physics of gravity. Um, and this is model B, where we're accreting all the way to the center. And obviously, that would not be mistaken for uh, for something like that, even with the EHT beam. Right, so it looks like a shadow, but it's less sharp. Uh, we don't really have resolution to really say something about that sharpness at that level yet, uh, but it is uh, somewhat smaller. And yeah, trying to make this a bit more systematic, if you observe that the inner edge of that torus is given by the maximum of the geodetic uh, rotation law, we can actually explore all the possible mini boson stars and see like where is what is the size of this mock shadow uh, for their uh, uh, compactness, for example. So this is done here just to show that this is a fairly general argument. We only do, did two simulations, obviously. Um, so this boson star model A uh, and boson star model B, which had just no shadow. And the observed shadow size, uh, uh, yeah, is shown here for those models. Uh, and in terms of angular size uh, of source Sagittarius A star. And you can see uh, that, yeah, the shadow size is significantly smaller than for all the care black holes. Um, and yeah, that's actually uh, quite good news. So we could uh, really distinguish a, a care black hole from the, some kind of boson star with this, uh, even if it had that kind of uh, mini torus. Uh, uh, inside of it. All right, so by M87, um, we can also say something. So if, if we believe the mass, then also something like this, uh, so the mass from stellar dynamics, I mean, then also something like this is really ruled out. So you would need to have a bigger mass to blow up that, uh, that structure. And also it's ruled out by the absence of a jet. Okay, uh, then I want to just conclude, uh, just giving you a bit of a summary. So I just uh, want to point out that yeah, we have really lots of detail in uh, current gravity and upcoming EHD observations, and uh, they really require sophisticated dynamical models. We understand the broad, broad, broad brush picture of an ex energy extraction jet formation reasonably well, um, but we need to now go somewhat beyond ideal GMHD, we're starting to put in resistivity, uh, allowing you to look at particle acceleration effects. Uh, so this is the kind of the direction we, I think it's going right now. Uh, I showed the two models about uh, erupting flux bundles and just showcased a few uh, inspirational pictures about uh, plasmoids forming and like, the accretion flow around a black hole. And yeah. It needs a bit more work still, but yeah, it's a nice avenue to really understand the dynamics uh, around compact objects. And with that, I think I'll uh, just looking forward to any questions you might have. I think I'm at the at the hour. Is that right? Yeah. Thank you, Oliver. Okay. So, if there are questions, please ask. There's a question in the chat. How are boson stars formed? Uh, yeah, boson, there's actually a paper by, uh, um, you can actually form them uh, due to collapse of the scalar field, in fact. So you can start from a large scale uh, uh, scalar field and then it can gravitationally collapse uh, to form this boson star. And that is uh, found as a formation mechanism. Um, right, so yeah, by gravitational collapse in principle, that, that can be done. It seems that the distribution of the angular momentum is crucial in these stars. So what defines this distribution of angular velocity and angular momentum? Right, so in, yeah, for the dynamics of the plasma, the omega, uh, the rotation profile is, uh, is crucial. Um, that's defined by the, uh, basically the profile of the mass, uh, as I kind of indicated, like for the example of the uh, galactic rotation profile. So it's actually, it's quite a nice intuition. So 
for more compact uh, objects, actually the EV mass increases more quickly. Uh, then actually then you generate this kind of maxima of the rotation profile. So yeah, it's, it's kind of determined by the compactness or so the less compact ones actually manage to have just uh, decreasing rotation profiles. Um, yeah, there's, a, there's quite a lot of uh, investigations into like these boson stars or also stars made of uh, like um, vector particles, vector bosons. Uh, and yeah, uh, some of them are stable, some are not stable. It would be quite interesting to look at rotating uh, boson stars uh, if you want to investigate like the jet formation and outflow in these kind of objects. So this mm -hmm. is something that's still upcoming. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Mm, I think there is uh, one question uh, by Professor Tsinganos. Yes, thank you for uh, your informative talk. And I have a simple question. Um, in the case of M87, we do see the black hole, quote unquote, and we see the jet. Uh, if we go now to the galactic center, the Sagittarius A uh, case, uh, okay, uh, is there any, uh, we, we see again the black hole in some way, but we don't see a jet. Can we call the uh, plasmoids that you describe as uh, uh, as a jet? I mean, as part of the uh, outflow. Uh, and what uh, uh, your simulations would be saying for the existence of a jet in the in galactic center? Yeah, so the simulations for the plasmoids were actually done for like a uh, kind of small scale fields where you don't really form a persistent jet. So you, the field topology would reverse quite quickly and you would never go into this magnetically rested uh, regime. So the uh, jet efficiency in that uh, model where you also have this outflowing uh, field uh, plasmoids is actually 10 to the minus four or so. It's really, really low. Uh, so I think that's kind of compatible with not seeing like a, like a standard jet. Um, however, you still have like these outflowing plasmoids uh, because like not having like strong saturating, saturated fields allows you kind of to, to like penetrate uh, plasma onto the, onto the black hole magnetospheres. So I'm not exactly sure if I answer your question. Um, um, so, but those simulations that I showed are actually quite compatible with not having a jet uh, in the galactic center. Whereas for the mat, uh, yeah, you, you might get a bit into trouble because those are very, really, really uh, known for having jets. And now we are looking almost into it as it seems uh, like 15 degrees or so that's the inclination angle like supposed by gravity. So um, yeah, there's, there's, there should be some, some like jet uh, feature, I think mad. Uh, so that may be another like, argument against this, this mad model. But yeah, I think the jury is still out uh, whether it has a jet or not. Thank you. What's the ejection velocity? Is it relativistic of this uh, uh, plasmoids or not? Uh, that's around like 0.1c or so. Uh, I think, yeah, ideally relativistic. I think I have that even on the slide somewhere. Um, I can go back. Uh, so VR, yeah, that's like, this is actually the velocity field of it. So it's like fluctuating quite a bit, but it's like on the order of 0.1c. Yeah. So this is for an unknown plasmoid. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Um, I have a question. Yeah, Maria. Uh, so, Oliver, oh, can you, maybe you said it, but I missed it. Could you explain why the velocity of these uh, flux band is, is sub Keplerian? Uh, right. So, um, overall, the mat uh, 
mm, the mat flow is actually so if you, if you look just at the same flow uh, and look at the velocity field it's actually very close to Keplerian um, but if you increase the strength of the field there's uh, also magnetic support and they this mat actually turns out the average rotation profile actually turns out to be sub Keplerian already uh, because of the added uh, magnetic uh, support now for these flux bundles um, they are kind of uh, <clears throat> yeah they kind of obstacles to the flow in a way so they are they have like a large scale magnetic field and if you want to move them through the accretion flow you actually have to like, exert work uh, so like along those uh, open field lines you will then actually uh, extract like, like angular momentum so they actually torque the accretion flow and so they are yeah they're kind of lagging behind so this was also kind of seen by Igumenchev already 2008 uh, yeah and then these op as they are obstacles in the flow you get like nice Kevin Helmholtz uh, surface modes and uh, all sorts of interesting things later but yeah uh, that's the general idea okay thank you yeah, so it is expected to be subkeplerian because I thought that you were surprised to see subkeplerian motion, Oliver. Well, I mean, if you look at the gravity data, I mean, it's, um, it's keplerian or even superkeplerian. Hmm. Yeah, and yeah, that's somewhat, yeah, how do you make that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, with the plasmoids, you can actually do that if you have an outflowing velocity, you can have some Doppler. Uh, Doppler shift actually, if it moves towards you, uh, you can actually uh, have some apparent uh, super Keplerian motion due to, due to the uh, time dilation effect. So um, that, that is actually something that you can save you in that other model. Yeah. Okay. Antonis has a question. Antonis Nathanael. Yes. So, so, okay, to me, it's obvious, obvious that the plasmoids are a better model. But uh, okay, so for the for the flux bundles, uh, you say they are sub keplerian So you rule them out and it's done, or you can imagine a way to put them back in game. I mean, for the flux. well, I mean, if the if the data is kind of, I mean, right now there's like significantly not compatible with the data. I mean, they're a factor of three or so sub keplerian uh, When you say the data, you you mean the modeling from the gravity collaboration or the data themselves? Also the data, because uh, the, the modeling by gravity was uh, assuming Keplerian flow, uh, but then the modeling by Matsumoto would just use the best fitting at whatever velocity, uh, super Keplerian velocity. And there, there the tension even increases, right? Um, so there we are a factor of three to slow. So yeah, I mean, I find it somewhat difficult to, to kind of, <laughs> I mean, they, we will not speed them up as <laughs> the data changes or, uh, I mean, you could imagine you have several of these flux bundles and then you just uh, look at several of them uh, and it's just an apparent motion, but this is really, really unlikely uh, if you consider the flare rate uh, and the fact that they're all like compatible to the same orbits. So yeah, like all the three data, uh, all the three measurements by gravity, uh, or can be fit by the same orbit. So that also tells us not just like some kind of coincidence. Um, um, yeah. I see another uh, question in the chat. So yeah, the gravity flares uh, go around four per, four per day. Uh, yeah, have like factor. Um, of 10 flux increases that's kind of the rate um, and that would be kind of compatible to kind of having like a large flux expulsion and then the re-accretion event so that's kind of sets the duty cycle and i think uh, sasha chikovskoy and uh, jason dexter made the argument that uh, that's kind of gives you a time scale uh, uh, that's compatible to this duty cycle actually so Right, so the just the time it takes to recreate it, uh, all the flux that you've expelled. Yeah. Uh, so that can be somewhat explained, actually, that, that, that time scale seems to be doing quite well. Mm, but I think, yeah, it, this is also somewhat simulation dependent. So like the mechanics of like how much flux you expel uh, for given parameters, uh, it's not 
yeah, understood. Right? Could be something that depends on initial conditions. Um, yeah, in the model by Jason Dexter, it kind of worked out quite well. Um, but yeah, that's not, not guaranteed. I don't think that's robust. Yeah. Going back to the super Keplerian motion, I was thinking that if somehow you make the B5 uh, to have the same direction with the V5, the rotation, then you increase the velocity, then you make the magnetic field to help you to increase the angular uh, velocity. I mean, think uh -huh. about the Ferraro's law. Like, like an inverse. So object. if you somehow have in the disk some portions of the, of the disk with the positive B5, then you make super Keplerian. Uh -huh. ah, anyway. Yeah, that's interesting thing about it. Mm. Locally, I mean, at least. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, think about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would like to ask about. something else. Uh, I realized in the motion of the flux bundles that you studied that uh, always the plasma vita was uh, greater than one. So is there a reason for that? Can you comment on that? Uh, yeah, so I'm... Uh, not a matter of definition, but I like to define these flux bundles at the regions where the MRI is suppressed. And that actually turns out to be uh, exactly where plasma beta is larger, uh, larger than one. Uh, so BZ square over P is larger than one. But uh, it was larger than one or smaller than one? Uh, uh, larger than one. So yeah, ah, you, ah, okay. you, can so, uh, you can go through a thin disk theory and get like, uh, like the suppression uh, of the MRI to correspond to, to that, yeah. Hmm. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. So other questions? Radiative transfer. Uh, yeah, I showed. Uh, Apostolos. <laughs> what do you yeah. mean exactly? Mean? Uh, I just sent one. Uh, what about what? Uh, thank you for your talk and. I was wondering what have you do about a radiative transfer around the black hole of M87. You said about dynamical effects, but what do you do about the radiation? I mean, yeah, we, we do radiative transfer. Um, like, like the EHD collaboration has like built a library of uh, GMHD models that were then radiatively um, solved by radiation transfer, as like doing some ray tracing and in, in curved space time, right? Um, and that resulted in like a, a library of around 70,000 images. Uh, and like one of them is just shown here. Um, so in principle, we, we, we do that. Uh, and actually the simulations of what the flux bundles, uh, I did a radiation transfer just to get like uh, the synchrotron luminosity, right? Uh, just to get the scale. So at least I want my model to recover um, uh, the synchrotron flux uh, of the galactic center, but yeah, you, you're asking about M87, but yeah, this, this is done in both cases, of course. Um, but I have not yet, of mm -hmm. course, um, like produced mock observab observables of those, those plasmoid, uh, of those uh, flux bundle uh, models. So that's kind of the next step. Yeah. I don't know. But in, in the radiative transfer, you you compute uh, synchrotron radiation, you said, and do you also consider any other processes that might be like important there, like Compton scattering? Yeah, for all these like low luminosity sources. So these are. So inverse Compton cooling is not really yet important in, in such a star and maybe kind of, yeah, in M87, you're kind of at the boundary where inverse Compton cooling might start to become important, uh, but that's typically not included. So what we do uh, try to, like in the EHT M87 uh, uh, workflow, what we do try to satisfy is that we, yeah, there is a Monte Carlo radiative transfer being done with Compton upscattering and for the parameters uh, that you choose, another additional constraint is that you don't want to overproduce the X-rays uh, by inverse Compton upscattering. That rules out like a few models, but not, not really many. Um, 
So that also tells you that it's really not uh, uh, like a big factor that inverse Compton of scattering. Okay, thank you. Okay. So I think there are no other questions. I don't see the raised hands. So let's thank again, Oliver, for this very nice talk. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, and have a nice evening. Yes. Um, yeah, it was really nice to see you. Yeah, yeah it was very nice. And uh, yeah, hopefully, let's hope that sometime again. we.